happened. <laughs> uh, it's been a, it's been a, it doesn't seem like it's been that long and then, then it does. Um, most of you now, I'm going to get ready to kind of hand over my position to, to Jessica here. Um, she is going to be the new face of history in Mendham, mm -hmm. and she knows so much more than I ever thought about knowing as far as the history of Webster Parish, and she knows how to find it, and she knows how to research it, and she knows how to Google it, <laughs> and, she, and her husband knows how to fix it if we can. But he can fix computers and telephones and anything else uh, that, that I have not a clue how to fix. Um, but Jessica's going to be our next speaker, and that's going to be May 8th. Y'all will be getting cards in the mail. I'm going to mail them out tomorrow. Uh, so I hope you come back and listen to what she's got to say as far as uh, why she's perfect for this job. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about her next month, but uh, I couldn't have created a person any more suitable to take this job. Uh, she, she loves history and she, she just knows so much. And if you get a chance and you're interested in genealogy, go see her. Uh, she puts on talks and things at the library for the genealogy field there. Is she going to bring anything up in particular or, or is it just going to be why she's good for this job? Because I hear that every day. <laughs> From who? Your wife? <laughs> you, you should be so lucky. <laughs> now we can't have, we do have an abundance of Chandlers and Grigsby's in the audience. No fights, no. <laughs> that goes way back. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, we have been trying to get Randy to come for going on three years. COVID hit. He was the next one, I think, up when COVID hit. And so we just scrapped his cards and kept thinking, okay, it'll, it'll be over soon. And, you know, two years went by and, 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 now, and now we're here. So I'm glad that he agreed to, to come and and. Since that time, he wrote another book, so he's going to talk about two books. Uh, so, I, so I'm really excited about that. He's going to have the books here uh, for you to purchase after uh, he gets through with this talk. We'll have a little uh, question and answer session, too, if you have questions about anything. Uh, but uh, like I said, Jessica's next month. Then in September, September 11th is our fundraiser. And it's a little different this year. You can come dressed as your favorite TV or movie character if you want to. So that should be fun. And it's a cake auction. That went so well last year. So if you want to bake a cake or some kind of good baked goods and bring it, we'll be auctioning off uh, baked goods. Richard Campbell and Tracy Campbell are going to be doing the auctioneer part. Um, that, was, that was just... Uh, we figured out that's the way to go. Uh, Becky is in charge of uh, what kind of refreshments and things we'll have and the ladies. Uh, if you are a board member and you're here tonight, raise your hand. We've got a few board members here. Got a new one back here, Robert Denman uh, from uh, Spring Hill area. Robert's going to be very valuable when we start working on our building next door and trying to get more uh, history from the north end. So that's, that's going to be really nice to have him on board. Um, after September, uh, October 9th, uh, Jake Chapman and Mark Shereen are going to come and they're going to talk about their statistic books for Menden High School that they've put together through the years. And so it'll be a, a night about Menden High sports. So that should be real good, real interesting. Uh, that's something they really worked hard on and, and went way back to, to get all these statistics. So that's what we've got coming up. We did uh, recently put out, and if you've got folks buried out at the Menden Cemetery, this is something Early Lyle and Ann Harlan worked on for years. I don't know what year, do you remember? I don't uh, remember maybe what year. about 2002, maybe? Something. Anyway, uh, we were able to get the file and reprint it. So if you, if you never bought one, it's 
and you go out to the cemetery a lot looking for people, trying to figure out where they're buried. Uh, this is a really handy book. We've got these now for forty dollars. We've still got the Taiwan on cookbook that we produced last year for the fundraiser. So if you're interested in those, uh, we got a few more of those to sell. So anybody got any questions with me before I turn it over to Randy? You ready? <laughs> Been waiting three years. <laughs> Thank you, Shelly, for all your help on this. And she she stayed with us till we got it done. A little thing called COVID pushed us back, uh, pushed everybody back a little bit. Let me say this: I appreciate everyone coming, and no matter where I go or where I live, Minden is still home. There's a special feel about this town that we can't explain. It's just, it was a great place to be raised. It was a great place to be. And up until a few minutes ago, Shelly may have been one of my favorite people getting me back, but Ben is now my favorite person. <laughs> because we turned on the computer and it was dead as a doornail. I mean, there was nothing going on. And he'd come in and it took him about four minutes to fix it. So Ben's a valuable guy. I do want to recognize two people. We've got two good friends that... Uh, Drove over from Shreveport, so Anthony, the coach, Cassio, and Martha, and she was a sawyer in Menden. So when this is over, introduce yourself and see if there's probably at least two cousins in here that we didn't know about. We really liked them, and they drove, drove over from Shreveport to hear this. We're going to try to do this in about 30 minutes. I've now got two books out. Um, but I wanted to start with something that we do a lot of times. We start out with a video that kind of sets the situation of what was happening in Germany in 1933. And as we go through this with the music, you'll notice how things were normal. It was like the historian wrote, after World War I, the world seemed to sail upon a summer sea. Everything was perfect after the First World War. But it only took about 15 years for the world to change. So if you will, let me play this, and then we'll get started on the discussion.
progression you saw is what happened in Germany in 1933, and this has always amazed me, how a nation as culture and as intelligent and smart as Germany could be taken over by a failed painter, a champagne salesman, and a chicken farmer. That's the three top Nazis that took over Germany. It's always amazed me how that happened, and what you saw was a progression here. You saw weddings were still going on, even though they had to wear the Jewish armbands. This is going to be okay. This is going to go away. And the things that, when I did interviews or I read about this, the thing that people got was, first of all, how it was so subtle in the way that it started. Hitler was a clown. He'll go away. Rational minds will come back into the political realm. Then it was the suddenness of the power that they took. They woke up one day and the Nazis are in charge. Now what do we do? It's too late. And then you saw the trains and you saw the camps. And people always talk about it. it was, the brutalness happened so quickly. It was like it happened overnight. And then everyone's trapped in this horror story of called Hitler's Europe. That has always amazed me. But I want to, if I could, I want to take just a minute on how these two books were written. Because I was going to graduate from tech and I was going to teach history at a university level and write about World War II. I knew about the Holocaust. I knew the Holocaust happened in between major battles. I knew this went on. That was not my thing. But in 2013, I bought Joyce a ticket to Israel. See, my wife always talked about going to Israel. I had no desire whatsoever, so I bought one ticket. Christmas morning, she opens it up, she cries, and she says, and you're going too. And I'm like, well, I didn't think that through very well, did I? Because I traveled for a living. When I sold, I traveled. Flew a lot. Didn't want to do it. So she had the pastor of the church became a cohort in crime with her. And I went in his office one day and he said, if you go, God has a gift for you. Well, that's kind of hard to pass up. But I did. I said, I'm still not going to go. I made up my mind. I told Joyce and I told the pastor. For 35 years, I've had to travel and people tell me where to be, how to get there, when to come home. I'm not going to go. Final answer. So on the way over... <laughs> I read Martin Gilbert's book on Israel. If you, if you haven't read it, read it. And when I got there, I knew something was going to happen. I began to read about Israel. And when we flew into Ben Gurion Airport that morning, the sun was coming up over the desert. It was a beautiful day. And Joyce was just crying. And she said, I said, what's, what's wrong? She said, I feel like I'm going home. That didn't register me then, but before we left Israel, I knew exactly what she was talking about. We stayed there for almost two weeks. We did the normal routine. If anyone's got, who's been to Israel? Okay, that's good. You do the normal routine. You go up the coast. You go to the Galilee. You come down to the Dead Sea, and then you go into Jerusalem. That's what we did. The night we were in Jerusalem, the first night in the Jerusalem hotel, I had a dream, and it was a neon sign in my dream, in red, it said, the Tehran children. And I'll, you'll understand who that is in a little bit. Now, I knew a little bit about the Tehran children because I had written, that time I was trying to write fiction, mainly spy novels. And um, in one of the books, the Tehran children is like a page in there. It's just a little part of the plot. And that was a spy book. It was very successful. I think it sold six copies. Since, <laughs> since 2006. But the Tehran children, it served its purpose. And I told Joyce the next morning, I said, I read about the Tehran children. It was a small group of children, 900 to 1,000, that were trapped in Europe. And it, it would, I said, this would make a beautiful story if I can find someone. So we go to the Yad Vashem that afternoon, the Holocaust Museum, and so we've got this little French lady that was our tour guide. They disguised her as a Catholic. She was Jewish. They, made, they taught her how to be Catholic so the Nazis wouldn't get her. And she was one heck of a you know, person to show us through there. But I asked her about the Tehran children, and she literally grabbed me and said, what do you know about the Tehran children? I said, well, I know a little bit. 
She said, this is a story that's not known outside of Israel. No one knows about the Tehran children. They're heroes here, but no one knows about them. So I said, what are my chances? After I figured out she wasn't going to hit me, I said, what are the chances of me finding a Tehran child? I mean, what are the odds? Out of a thousand children in the middle of World War II, what are the odds that I would find one? She said, wrote a lady's name down, Marty Marinsky, teaches the Holocaust in Israel. She'll find you a Tehran child. So we came back. This is the summer of 2014. We came back and... I emailed Rudy. Rudy said, Joe Rosenbaum lives in Los Angeles. He was a Tehran child. So what are the odds of this happening like this? So I shoot off an email. One week, two weeks, three weeks, nothing. And I thought, you know, World War II veterans, Holocaust, they don't want to talk about this. It was a great idea, but it's probably not going to fly. One morning I turn on my computer. There's an email. My name is Joe Rosenbaum. I was a Tehran child, and I will tell my story. So that's how it came to be. And you'll see a picture of Joe in just a little bit. From that, we became the best of friends. We talked to his wife all the time. Since now, Joe has had several strokes. He's in his mid-80s. He's very sick. We don't get to talk to him anymore. But during that time, he and I talked for 40 hours of interviews. We flew to Los Angeles and did the last interview face-to-face -face with him. But there were some critical things I had to get right. This became an obsession to writing about Joe Rosenbaum, a little eight-year-old child. And I'm going to show you the slides real quick. But think about this. He gets run out of uh, Cologne, Germany in October of 1938. He's eight years old. His mother and his sister. His father is here in America trying to get a job because at that time he had to have a job to bring anyone over. The Germans come in, you're out of here. <clears throat> Luckily, good news is they had in-laws in Poland. The bad news is they had in-laws in Poland. It was the worst place in the world to be in the fall of 1939. The Germans come in, the Russians come in. The Russians put them on a train and send them to Siberia. Five years, an eight-year-old child, five years on the road, never slept in a bed, Never had a complete meal for five years. Now, what did we worry about when we were eight years old? A new baseball glove? Maybe a girlfriend or somebody that we liked? Joe just tried to survive for five years. And so this is how his journey started. This is Joe. Let me back up just a second. I hit the wrong button, so here we go. This is the Rosenbaum family. That's Rena on the left. She's the general of the, she's the gatekeeper of the family. She wanted to know who am I and why was I here and why do I talk for me. It took me a long time to convince them I spoke Southern Hebrew. But she was, now she and Joyce are the best of friends. We've talked to her at least probably every couple of months. That's Joe on the left. Joe Rosenbaum. On the far end, that's his complete family. On the far end, the tall guy, the big basketball player, paid for Pepperdine basketball. Simon Rosenbaum, he wrote a, a college dissertation, my sabbat, my grandfather. That was the guy that I had to write this book. I mean, what better way to learn about a man than through the heart and the love of a grandson that wrote a college thesis on it? It was about 70 pages. But they gave me that copy. It gave me something to work with. Let me, let me go back. I'm sorry. You can tell I'm technically challenged here. Okay. We've covered this. Hitler was in power by the end by 1819. This is Joe, and this is his father who went to America. His father took him to see Adolf Hitler parade in Cologne. Joe is not, I don't know, what does he look like, five or six maybe here? He tells in the book, you'll read in the book, that his father took him to the boulevard where Hitler was, and Hitler comes by and they've got the Nazi flags popping, and you can imagine, you can just see the image of how they put on these shows. And everybody was saying, Heil Hitler. Joe said, Heil Hitler too. Because he didn't know as a child, he thought, well, this is exciting. So everybody's for this guy. So he loves to tell that story. This is the family. 
That's Joe, and Mina was her mother. Inez, at that time, in 1938, was in Belgium. She'd gone to stay with an uncle. She eventually got to America by one day. They got out of Brussels the day before the Germans came in. Then Simon is the father, and then little Nellie, the little girl. So Joe and Mina and Nellie were the ones on the five-year journey. This is the journey they took. Through Poland, up to Siberia. They stayed in Siberian camps, minus 50 degrees. Children worked cutting lumber. Children worked gathering rubber. And you ate by how much rubber you gathered. Sometimes Joe got a half a piece of bread for the day. Minus 50 degrees. Children died, just fell out. When they got on the trains heading south into uh, Uzbekistan and Persia, some of the kids were suffering so bad they threw themselves under the trains. They just couldn't live anymore with it. 14 year old kids, I can't do this. But they get to Tehran. This is where the name Tehran children come in. They get to Tehran. And now they're in a British camp. It's an old army base. And so they had a little bit of food, but still they're starving. They're starving to death. And the Americans can't do anything because they need the Arab oil to run the tanks in Italy and Sicily. So they don't want to make the Arabs mad. The Arabs refuse to let the Jewish kids go across the land. The British can't do anything about it because they need the Arab gas in the air wall to fight the Nazis in North Africa. It's a political snafu. It's, a, it's just a maze of politics. Now. So they're in Tehran. I'm going to flash forward ahead because the second book is about a lady named Henrietta Zoe. See, that story and the, story, the second story are linked by one event. In February of 1943, they got out of Tehran because of one 78-year-old woman named Henrietta Zoe. She refused to give up. She embarrassed them to the point where they finally gave them travel permits to come to Palestine. They were only safe when they got to Palestine. Jews were only safe at that point. They were safe nowhere till they, became, till they got to Palestine. Thus the name, a train to Palestine, in safety. They leave Tehran and their travels aren't over exactly. They go by Yemen, Karachi, India. They get attacked by planes. Some of them are killed on the top of the boats. They're strafed. But by the time they get to Egypt, they get off and they see every soldier they've ever seen has been a threat to them. And Joe tells about in the book, he gets out and he sees soldiers they have the Star of David patch. And they know <coughs> these are good guys. And they actually were a battalion of engineers, Jewish engineers, working in North Africa with the, with the British Army. And from there it goes on to Palestine. They reach Palestine in February 13th, 1945. That's only half the story. But you're going to have to buy the book to hear the rest of it. <laughs> This is nothing. Now, this is a hero. Man. You come across heroes. Henrietta Zoe, I came across. I wasn't going to write about her, didn't know about her, until I began to read. And I said, that's my second book. It's not Eisenhower or Patton. It's Henrietta Zoe. She just, 86 years old, 15 hour days, seven days a week. She refused to give up. Her job was to get Jewish children out of, out of uh, Nazi Germany, out of Nazi Europe. And if you don't know the facts, you know that 1.5 million Jewish children were murdered. They got 20,000 out. 1.5 million. Of the top five killing camps, Treblinka being the largest, Sobovor, of those five killing camps, not one child survived because they killed them within an hour. They were the first one. They were led straight from the trains to the gas chambers and killed. That's where the 1.5 million number just looks horrific. Some adults actually survived the killing camps. You've read stories about it. So let's, let's move on to Henrietta. But let me just leave Joe with this. A 
train to Palestine is nothing less than the human will to survive. See, when I was re researching this and reading this, how does this person give up and this person refused to give up. And they're suffering the same. They're starving to death. They're freezing to death. Typhoid just wipes out camps. Some survive and refuse to die. Others give up. I, I, I've never understood the difference in that. There's a different chemistry in some people. You'll read the book and you'll stop and think, Joe should have been dead four or five times. He just refused as a little child to die. He just refused to. He always thought he was going to see his mother again. One other, one other quick thing on this book. This is General Anders. You wander into these heroes. There's a lot in there about the Polish army. For you guys that look like military part of World War II, you're going to read a part of World War II that you've never read before probably, because I didn't. There's a whole section of the Polish army that was captured by the Soviets and then released when the British and the Soviets signed a treaty, they released the Soviet soldiers, and Stalin, so, Stalin saw an opportunity to release the Jewish refugees too, to get rid of them. This man disobeyed direct orders from the Polish army in exile headquartered in London. He disobeyed direct orders. How many times do you read about the general doing that? He brought the Jewish children with him, 10,000 of them out of Siberia. And if he hadn't had that bravery about him, you'll also learn how well the Polish soldiers fought. They were, they were vicious fighters because they were fighting for something. They were fighting for Poland. Okay, and there's some pictures here. This is the Tehran children. This is the Tehran children arriving on February the 18th. That's Henrietta Zoe on the top left. She personally met and interviewed every Tehran Jewish child in Palestine when they came off the train. <clears throat> Getting to know Henrietta, reading about Joe and researching about Joe and I keep coming across Henrietta Zoe. I don't want to write about some old Jewish lady. I want to write about Eisenhower or Poe or Patton or someone. But the more I read, this was the most amazing person that I've ever read history about. I found her letters. I found her diaries. And Henrietta Zoe became my next Look, I said, I told you, I said, it's the last one ever right. This is the one. This is the one. There's actually two stories in the book. There's one about what was happening in Germany and what was happening in Palestine. And then the t that's where the title comes from, A Labyrinth of Darkness and Light. The darkness was Europe. The light was Palestine, which is now we know we call Israel. It was called Palestine until 1948. There was another lady, Risha Fryer, who actually started, I'm going to use the term here, Youth Aliyah. That was a division of the Jewish agency to get the Jewish children out. She actually started it. She was a poet, a children's writer, daughter of a, of a rabbi in Berlin. She was the visionary, but she wasn't the one that could make it happen. She wasn't the one that you put the hand on the throttle to make this work. So... The first group left in 1932. This is Henrietta. Henrietta was raised in Baltimore. She was the daughter of a rabbi. And she had two epiphanies in her life that changed everything. A good friend of mine, Jimmy Graves, works for Community Renewal. He says the two greatest moments in a person's life is when they're born and then the day they realize why they were born. And it took two horrible events for her to understand 1880 Prague, she sees how the Jewish women cannot go in the synagogues. They have to look in little windows and look. And one of the Jewish women stands on a box and tells the others what's going on in the synagogue. And she said, I'm going to change that. I'm going to be an educator of the Jewish women, and we're going to change this. The other one is 1909 Palestine. She was heartbroken. The man she was supposed to marry, Professor Ginsburg, she thought he was going to come back from Europe 
and, and asked to marry her. He came back and said he was engaged to a German woman. She had a nervous breakdown. She went down as far as she could go. How many times does God do this? When you're as far down as you can go, then he says, okay, now I'm going to use you. And that's what he did with Henrietta. 1909, his, her mother sent her to Palestine and they went together and they saw Jewish children in Palestine. There was no hospitals, there were no clinics, nothing. She saw the little Jewish children and the little Arab children with flies in their eyes, disease in their eyes. Now she had started, how many people know what Hadassah is? That's the Jewish women's organization. It's over 300,000. If you go to your, uh, Israel, if you went to Israel, you saw the big hospitals on the hill. That's Hadassah Medical Centers. It started with 12 women in a Bible study in a synagogue in Brooklyn. From 12 people there are now over 300,000 women strong. And they build all these beautiful medical centers and hospitals. But that day in 1909 on the side of that dirt road, on the Jaffa Road, her mother said, you should not be doing Bible studies. You should not be looking at photographs. This is why you should do. This is what you were made for. So she left and came back to Palestine in 1920. She was going to stay two years. She lived the rest of her life, 1920 to 1945. She always wanted to come back to America. And her sisters, they had a very close relationship. One had a farm in Connecticut, and that's where she wanted to retire. In the spring of 1931, that's where she was. She had gone to America. She had gone to America where she wanted to be to retire, and she was safe. She was out of this chaos of what Europe was becoming. But Hitler disposed otherwise, and she went back. And by that time, the German, you can imagine what's happening in Germany. Germany awake. <coughs> One of the journalists that I got to know, William Meyer, said, she answered my question for me. How did the Germans allow this to happen? She said, the German people had the unreality of sixth sense to disbelieve the truth that was right in front of them. They just refused to believe the truth. She went back, Henrietta Zoll went three times to Berlin. Every time it was more dangerous. 1933, 35, and 37. Last time she went, this is her quote, the Jews are now living corpses. They're incapable of only one emotion, fear. See, by 1937, the German Jews have figured out, we're not going to get out of here alive. We need to get the children out. And there was the book burning. That was the point where Lee and Meyer, the writer, said they knew then that it was all over. When they burned the books in May of 1933, we know now the worst is going to happen. Okay, I'm going to move a little quicker here, but it's like a, you know, Henrietta is actually a three-hour course, as far as I'm concerned. But there's two people that made her, it's a, it, you thought the eyes, you can imagine as the man and the deaths began to happen and the reports came in of the Holocaust and all the bad things, see, you're beginning to learn this now. It's too late, of course, but we're beginning to learn this. <clears throat> you thought the eye blossomed they had thousands of people now working, Austria and England, to get those children out. Because they knew the minute the war started, the doors were closed and those that left would die. And that's what happened. But they brought two people in, two great characters you'll read about. Hans Beth was a banker. And uh, she, I think she kind of had a, I think she kind of had a flirtation with Hans. Of course, he's like 40 years younger than her. But Henrietta liked Hans and he did. The other one was an American Jew, Emma Ehrlich, and there a lot of times in the book. Now, Henrietta was tough. She did not take no. She did not take this can't be done. This is impossible. She refused to believe it. Okay, if it's impossible, you got two weeks. But this lady was her secretary, and she would let her rant and rave and throw a fit and chew out politicians and whoever, and then she would lean down and say, Now, Henrietta, we're going to finish up here, then we're going to be nice. So she had control of Henrietta. 20,000 Yuthaliot children got out during 1933 and 1935. These were the Tehran children. That was a, she said that was the most important thing she'd ever done. 
is heading up Youth Aliyah and getting the children out. She died on February 13, 1945, and she's never married, never had children of her own. And she always in her letter, you know, what are we gonna how are we gonna write history now that people don't write letters and we have them? I mean, we're gonna look at emails. But see, when people wrote letters, they wrote them like, nobody else is ever going to read this but Beth, my sister in Connecticut. So they told their heart. And she would read, she would say, the one thing I regret, I would even do it over, is I wanted children of my own. Well, she did. She had 20,000. <laughs> and one of the youth all the children at her grave site spoke the mourner's prayer. The Kaddish, the Jewish morning prayer, mourner's prayer. Why is it important that we know Joe's book and Henrietta's book? See, I believe, there, I, I believe there's a purpose beyond just writing the two books. Because of this, 65% of adults cannot recognize the word Auschwitz. 45% cannot name one killing camp. If you get into the millennials, which is what, 31 to 40 something? Yeah, now the, now the numbers go. They don't even believe it happened. They know not, they're not being taught about the Holocaust. And just, just as a personal note, this is where I want to be. I want these books in schools. I want to talk to children about this. I want them to see. Here's the amazing thing our grandchildren. Joe came to Shreveport and spoke before, just weeks before he gets really sick. My grandchildren got to meet Joe. Two little girls got to meet Joe. And I said, Dan, you know it's true. Here's the man that lived this story. It's true. That's why I think these books are so important. Now, we're in, in America. Israel is in trouble. Here's some of the universities. University of Wisconsin has a free Palestine. You know, that's now you're, there is no free Palestine. There is no Palestine since 1948, but they managed to boycott or commandeer that name Palestine. If you see it on the news, it's usually over in the West Bank. Some of the, uh, what's the, I forget the name of the, of the Arab group that's very radical. Pomona College, president, the president of Pomona College, a major university, doubts the Holocaust ever happened. Duke University. When we think of Duke, what do we think? Southern University with a good basketball team. They have an anti-Israel conference every year. So that's, that's why this is so uh, deep into my heart. And that's why I have a heart for Israel. That's why Joyce and the pastor were right when we started telling this story. It was a, it was a gift that I just love Israel. And in any, any, any enemy of Israel is an enemy of mine. That's why, you know, we do the phrase, it never happened again. You know, you always heard never again, right? The Holocaust. It can happen in a heartbeat. It can happen tomorrow. It can happen in a week. Jews are leaving France. Jews are leaving America now because they don't feel safe unless they're in Israel. That's God's land and God's people. So, I blew my 30 minutes. <laughs> any, any questions, comments, re rebuttals? Anything? I want to thank you for coming. I believe in the Holocaust. I'm sorry? I believe that the Holocaust happened. But this makes it personal. To deal, to sit with Joe and hear him, he didn't break for many, he, he, he did a lot of interviews over like the first, he never broke. But then there's one episode in there, he broke. And his wife said he's never broken like this. It, it, it pulls a string inside of you that I'm, I'm not going to allow this. 
We can't allow this. Not again. They would love to do. The bad guys would love to take all the Jews and kill them. 6.5 million nay, let's just get started. They can really go with this. It, we cannot allow it to happen. So, thanks for listening. Oh, sorry. 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 Just a sec. You know, um, hate crimes are, are just ramping up. Uh, can't think of the word I'm trying to say now, but at a rocket's pace in America, and a large percentage of them are against it. The Jewish Absolutely. people. Yes. So it's trying to happen again. Yep. It's trying to happen again right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've always had a heart for the Jewish people too, and I don't, I don't really even know why. I just love their story. That I love that that for the most part they obeyed God's decree to not intermarry and. After low as many thousands of years, there's still a large um, number of true Jews. Most most groups intermarry and you know lose our identity. And then in the forties, with all the things that were happening, and I'm sure they didn't even understand why, but they. So many of them felt the need to pull up roots wherever they were and go form the Israeli state again. I mean, I, they're just an amazing people. See, that's what I'm working on now. There's actually another book. It's about the 48 war. But think about this. The Jewish people, it was prophesied 2,800 years ago and Israel would become a nation. The same people, the same land, the same language. The, the fact that they even speak Hebrew, the odds of that. Think, where else in history has that happened? Because, well, we've all read the book. And Israel is a, a major part of that book. But, boy, we get, we're off into another conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I just wanted you to tell, because it could happen to us too. It might not be the Germans versus us, but how they came into the schools and the churches and went after the children. That was their yeah. Well, they didn't have to. Uh, they just counterfeited everything that was in Germany. They went into the German church. Have you ever read Bonhoeffer about Diedrich Bonhoeffer? It's a, it's a great book. He was one of the church. He fought it, ended up giving his life, but he refused to turn, just turn over the German church to the Nazis. They went in and said, we want to fly the Nazi flag in the churches. And they said, well, I mean, they are elected officials. They won an election, and they did win the first election. Then they came back and said, well, we want to also do the Heil Hitler's salute. So now you've got a German church from a distance that looks like a German church, and it's been confiscated into a Nazi thing. And we've all heard of the, the Hitler Youth Movement. Hitler didn't have to start that movement from the ground up. They counterfeited. That was a church youth movement. And he simply moved it over here and began teaching them that the Jews were not human. These were kids that were in the German youth groups two years before. So they always counterfeited everything that was already, that, we, that the German people conceived as good and normal. Um, they were, Nazis were good at evil. They were very good at evil. And that's why it could happen at any time to anyone. Okay. No, was there another? I was just going to say that when Joe came to Shreveport to y'all's house, y'all were kind of up to invite us. I think Billy and Jane, they went. And just hearing, hearing Joe talk, 
Now, he did have a good sense of humor. Oh, too. Okay. And he loved pretty girls. He yes, loved those grand did. girls. Yes, I mean, he just. But I mean, really you were just life. seeing someone and listening to them. You know, when I was young in the 60s and growing up, you'd hear people that were in, men that were in the military talk about it and, and about the Holocaust and all that. And I, on a trip, believe it happened. It did happen. There's no doubt about it. But we have, we have kids growing up nowadays that they're just getting fed a lot of along. It just, it's just mind-boggling the direction our country's going. And I tell you what, if we don't wake up, I don't want to make this a political thing, but I mean, it could happen again. Mm -hmm. See, some people in Germany, Joe's uncle, he said, I'm out of here. He left. He went to Palestine in 1932 and started a, candy, a chocolate store, candy store. That's where Joe ended up. But most of them said, nah, this is, this is a little over. Mm -hmm. uh, just keep in mind, when we looked at the first PowerPoint, you noticed Eisenhower in there. Eisenhower came with Patton and all of his guys, and they made the German people, whatever town was nearby, he would make all the German people come in. He said, nobody's ever going to say this didn't happen. I want it documented. He flew in journals, photographers. That was the purpose of it. But now, if kids aren't being taught, if, Amer if adults aren't being taught, adults don't believe it. The, 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 the stats that you can look up for yourself, just go, you know, Holocaust deniers. You'd be shocked at the percentage of adults that just say this probably didn't happen. Okay, I'm stopping. I'm sorry. I'm um, I'm going to say something. I, I know probably several of you have been to the Holocaust Museum in D.C. And, and the part to me that was the most moving, and I'm sure the ones that went and seen it, are all those shoes, all those children's shoes piled up, and you can smell that leather. It's just such a different, I don't know, it was just so moving to be able just to go through there to where those shoes were, and, and I actually got there late that day, and it was about a week after they had had the shooting that had killed the guard, and they weren't letting just anybody go in there, and I begged that guard, I said, I am from Louisiana, I will probably never get back here, please let me go through, and he let me go through, he said, just don't, you know, don't spend all day in there because it was getting close to closing, but I, I ran through as fast as I could, and that was the part that, you know, I'll just never forget that smell of all that leather. And that Sick. We went to 2014, 2015 we went to Amsterdam, Auschwitz, then to Israel. So we went to Auschwitz. And if that, do you, have you been? Been there, and what I was struck with through Germany and through that area place. It's just like America. It didn't look any different from the other country. To me, I got a sense that they will never get the evil out of the place. Yeah. Yeah. It sweeps over you. <clears throat> you know, the Germans tried to deny that it happened. The German people. But a historian named Martin Gilbert, remember the book I was reading on the way to Israel when I wasn't going to go? He, he pegged them. He said the trains gave them away. They live in a village. The trains go through full of Jews. They come back that night empty. Where are the Jews going? I mean, he said, he said the trains gave them away. They knew. They knew. But the vast majority of them did. Okay. Thank you so much. I apologize for going over my... 30 minutes. Now Randy does have both books and he's able to take credit cards, checks or cash.